all of a sudden, this one guy, Danny, we just hear, ah! Ah! and we just go, what the hell was that? And we just see this little plump kid jump out of this frigid cold water just go running into the woods. Welcome to Achieving Failure, a podcast about the adventures of life. I'm your host, Chris, and join us each week as we bring you a collection of autobiographical stories that made us who we are. From the glitz and the glamour to hitting rock bottom, this is Achieving Failure. You too can almost be somebody. So, Manhunt was a game that we used to play in the Boy Scouts, and one can argue, oh, Boy Scouts, that's stupid, that's gay, blah, blah, blah. However, the Boy Scouts that we were in was a little bit different, and one of the games we played was Manhunt. Now, Manhunt, I've never heard of it until I obviously joined the Scouts, and it was almost kind of like tag, almost, where you have two separate teams... It was like hide-and-seek tag almost. However, you had two teams. One team would stay inside for a certain amount of, for a certain period of time. The other team would go outside. Now, this has to be done outside, and this has to be done at night. No flashlights. So, we were in the woods, pitch black, and the other team has to hide, and you have, let's say, two minutes. You have two minutes to go hide. The other team has to come find you. The point of the game is the seekers have to find the hiders and bring them back to a designated area of the seekers choosing which they consider jail now the point of the game is to get all the hiders into jail and get everybody captured now what makes it interesting is while you have people in this quote-unquote jail cell area if the Hider is able to physically tag one of his teammates, they're freed from jail. The problem is, in order to get caught, like the guy has to grab you, he says, Yeah, I got you, uh, one, two, three, manhunt. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it's like he has to physically hold you. He's like, I got you, manhunt, something like that. Now, imagine. Oh, God, yeah, I forgot about that. Like, now, it was one, two, three, manhunt. And yeah, if you couldn't hold on, because. Yeah, it was at that point like you would wrestle to get away. Yeah, you were breaking free like a cop is arresting you against your will. Yeah, you You're doing falling. what you can. So, what wound up just happening was just everything just completely devolved into complete utter and chaos. To which I'll kind of turn it over to Mike for some of his adventures. Now that we've established the rules of manhunt. I will kind of turn it over to Mike because Mike has some fond adventures of Manhunt also. So, I mean, we, we, I mean, we did this for, I mean, well over a decade. I think we started experimenting with Manhunt at sunset when we were like 12 ish out at your parents' house and your parents live up in the hills and the woods, which by itself are treacherous enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is literally the hills leading into upstate New York, right at the New York, New Jersey boundary. It is mountainous. It is steep, really easy to get completely fucked up, break a leg, fall down, impale yourself on shit. Like really, really easy, especially when you're playing in the pitch black and you're using moonlight or starlight as your fucking guide. We always had established where home base was, which is where everybody had to start. We always established where the jail was. And jail and home base were never allowed to be co-located because they had to be far enough apart that it made it more reasonable for people to be able to hide to go and get them. So normally the team that was being hunted would have more people than the team that had the hunters. The hunters was usually like two or three people. The team that was being hunted had like maybe five or six and like to go and find them. So you would try to hide and conceal yourself. And I mean, like this is, you know, mid to late 1990s, North Jersey. There's not cell phones. We're not talking using flashlights. There's no walkie talkies. We're covering ourselves 
in debris and dirt and mud and leaves and sticks and trees to conceal ourselves as if we're fucking Navy SEALs hiding out from the fucking Gestapo. And, and like, we're consistently moving. You would keep a one position, but you wouldn't stay in that position. Because as soon as the hunter came near you, you would go and like run as fast as you can to relocate or get your eyes on the jail and get your buddy out. And it was a constant metamorphosis of just absolute chaos. And it only got better as we started at first. You know, we started 12 or 13, so we weren't legally allowed to drink. And then occasionally we'd find or steal beers and whatnot and then as we got into our 20s continuing to play this like it just got much more chaotic because now we're able to travel further from home base we're able to travel further from the jail we know sort of the terrain a little bit at least during daytime because you do you, you do you go and you kind of scope out the area a little bit you're like i'm playing manhunt tonight i'm gonna go take a walk in the woods because i gotta figure out what this all looks like. Otherwise, I'm going to be completely, literally lost in the woods. And it's very easy to get turned around in an environment like that. And you always felt like I'm amazed that none of us ever fell down a dike or got really fucked up or broken. I do recall this one time and we were doing it down by the park a few blocks from your house. And we were doing math on it and like right across the open ravine. And like we were talking about a minute ago, you know, you had to grab onto somebody and say one, two, three manhunt in order to capture them. But that would mean like you're doing everything to dodge and wiggle and you're like shedding articles of clothing as they're grabbing onto me. No, you didn't get me, motherfucker. I'm still and like it got to wrestling at some points on occasion. But like I remember like this one time, like I'm playing the hunter and Chris is hiding and I come out and I try to grab and tag him and he just shoulder checks me like over a curb and into this like thorny briar. And like, I mean, it was completely, completely thorns. Like I, I came out, my arms were bleeding, my legs were bleeding, like everything. I was like, wow, I just got super fucked up. Like I, when I landed, I remember like, I don't know how to get out of this without hurting myself more. I remember playing, and this was back when I did the Boy Scouts, and I'll never forget one of the guys we played with. I was one of those guys who were I'm the high the the seekers or the hunters, whatever you want to say. And we were in this little log cabin, which is actually kind of cool, like a little a little tangent on something else. We were playing at this Boy Scout camp called Nobi Bosco, which wound up actually being the first time I went. I did not know, but Nobi Bosco was actually the original Camp Crystal Lake for Friday the 13th. Yeah, uh, Camp Nobi Bosco is where uh, Friday the 13th 1 and 2 were filmed. So it was actually kind of a little cool thing that when you're 16 years old your dad picks you up and goes oh hey guess where you just stayed i said oh oh that's cool so this particular time we're literally at crystal lake right there right at the lake you had the guard tower in the distance and we come out of the shack it was it was like a, it was a broken house that like hadn't been occupied since the 40s and they had a boathouse yeah it was an that was attached boat house. to it that was abandoned so I'm gonna do, I remember kind of, it. So I'm gonna try to do a side by side comparison. Anyway, we we're the hunters. Recording we, again. We come out of this like boathouse, whatever this old boathouse log cabin that we were actually sleeping in, and we come running out into the night. And maybe thirty feet outside the cabin, there was this long river with a bridge, and it was thirty two degrees outside. There was snow everywhere, and all of a sudden, this one guy, Danny, we just hear, ah! Ah! and we just go, what the hell was that? And we just see this little plump kid jump out of this frigid cold water, just go running into the woods. Because I guess the entire time we were like letting everybody go and hide and camouflage themselves. This is probably about five minutes. I guess he immediately just ran into that river 
and just hid under the bridge. And I don't even oh, know God. how cold the water is when it's 32 degrees outside. Oh, God, no. <laughs> but it was still, it was ice everywhere. And he got up, and I, I'll never forget, he had shorts and a white T-shirt on. And he just took off running into the woods, and eventually he just gave up and came back into the lodge because he almost had hypothermia. And I remember they were like, okay, we got to, like, stop playing this game. And I think that was the only time that we actually considered it dangerous because... A lot of people rolled down hills, fell into trees, the trees. and people got re- A lot of people got really hurt playing that game, but never mm-hmm. our group. Never. Nobody ever got impaled. I mean, people rolled down hills. People tripped on rocks and went flying through the air. Fell through trees. Fell through trees. Fell into holes. Never, never broke anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, we were also the generation that at the same time, like we were the ones that really identified that playgrounds are a lawsuit liability. You can't have a merry-go-round and expect, you know, 16 year olds to not use it as a death spinner mm. to see who gets to fly off at the highest velocity, how long you can hold on before puking. Like we were the reason why like a lot of there's no longer tire forts in places anymore because of people like us. That's a, uh, but that's a reality of the time. And, but I never was at Nobi Bosco in winter. I was only ever there during the summer, but I do still remember some of the legends too, because I mean, my, my, I mean, decades, decades earlier, my grandfather had been a scoutmaster at the camp and my mother had worked in the medical tent at the camp. And, like, I, mean, I remember them telling me stories about, like, when they did the production of uh, Friday the 13th, the first one, like, there was still always this rumor that was floating around that, like, one of the mechanisms uh, for the special effect at the end where Jason, like, comes and drags the girl into the lake, like, was still there and had malfunction and would occasionally reach up and accidentally just grab kids and drag them and drown them. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I remember so many legends from that stuff. But, I mean, this is also in the same area that, like, the Jersey Devil, but granted, Jersey Devil was, in theory, further south in the Pine Barrens. But you had, like, Wendigo. You had, I mean, this was in the same area that they recorded Blair Witch years later the one thing even though you had all these different legends the one thing that was actually true was there were these gigantic 50 foot power lines that ran across the parking lot and we would actually park our cars underneath them and the insane hum that was coming off of these things you kind of just sat there getting out of your car you're kind of like high voltage ones you're kind of like looking up so you want a fun story about those types of power lines that's actually how george lucas and industrial light and magic recorded blasters and lightsabers hey this is your host chris again i would like to say thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of achieving failure and we hope you enjoyed our adventures And if you have a life story you want to share with us, shoot us an email at aflvpodcast at gmail.com. That's AF, Achieving Failure, LV, Las Vegas, podcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.